I think one of the reasons why Trump got elected was because he spoke out against career politicians. He spoke out against the corporate elite. That's something that many people in America agree with. Many people see a political class, a corporate elite running the country that doesn't actually reflect their needs or values. And so when he spoke about draining the swamp, they connected with that idea. Of course, many of us saw what his voters didn't, that he had no intention of actually doing that. And we see this in his campaign nominees, who are not just the swamp, they're the best swamp, the biggest swamp, tremendous swamp, big leg swamp. So right now we have Kelly, Mattis, Pompeo, Haley, Chow, and Tillerson that have been voted on. Let's look through the Democratic senators and see the people who voted for four, five, or six of these nominees, voted in favor of the swamp. And I'm not even going into one, two, and three votes. I'm giving you a bit of a curve here and just starting at four. Senator Maggie Hassan, five out of six votes for the swamp. Timothy Kane, five out of six. Heidi Heitkamp, six out of six, including Tillerson. Tammy Duckworth, four out of six. Brian Schatz, five out of six. Richard Blumenthal, three out of six, while abstaining a vote for or against Pompeo. Joe Manchin, six out of six votes, including Tillerson. Chris Coons, three out of six votes, and abstaining voting for or against Tillerson. Al Franken, four out of six votes. Michael Bennett, four out of six votes. Jeanne Shaheen, five out of six. Mark Warner, six out of six, including Tillerson. Gary Peters, four out of six. Sheldon Whitehouse, five out of six. Bob Casey, four out of six. John Tester, four out of six. Claire McCaskill, five out of six. Amy Klobuchar, five out of six. Joe Donnelly, five out of six. Maisie Hirono, four out of six. Christopher Murphy, four out of six, while abstaining a vote for or against Pompeo. Bob Menendez, four out of six. Ed Markey, four out of six. Benjamin Cardin, four out of six. Sherrod Brown, four out of six. Tammy Baldwin, four out of six. Debbie Stabenow, four out of six. Mr. Liberal Hero of the Resistance, Chuck Schumer, four out of six. Jack Reed, five out of six. Bill Nelson, four out of six. Patrick Leahy, four out of six. Diane Feinstein, five out of six. Richard Durbin, four out of six. Thomas Carper, four out of six. Maria Cantwell, four out of six. These are the people representing the Democrats. These are the people representing the only major liberal party in America. And the vast majority are completely in support of the most corrupt billionaire class cabinet going in. These Democrats don't represent us anymore. They are not pursuing liberal values on a whole because they are owned by the same wealthy interests as the Republicans. We can't rely on them anymore. If we don't save democracy in America, who will? It's just us. Just us Democrats. The Democratic Party is corrupt and it's impotent, and we need your help if we're going to. Fix it. We have neo-Nazis in the White House and we're funding Al-Qaeda, and I'll be goddamned if I don't try to. Fix it. We are turning away at our borders the very people we should be inviting in. The justice Dems are here, too. Fix it. The Supreme Court, our schools, the very fabric of our democracy may be forever broken if we don't. Fix it. The Democrats are owned by the same corporate overlords and Republicans. Climate change starts as a continuation of our species unless we do something to fix it. I'm Cliff and with my co-host Miguel, we're looking at a broken America and how we can fix it. Hello, I'm Cliff Hansen and welcome to the premiere episode of Just Us, the Justice Democrats podcast. I'm here with my co-host Miguel Gravel. Hey, glad to be here, Cliff. This is our second time recording this episode. We're still figuring out some of the audio, technology, all that jazz. Yeah, I'm really excited about how much enthusiasm Justice Democrats is getting. We haven't even released this first episode yet, and people have been sharing it. We've had people liking the page, and it's fueling me. Yeah, I was just at a community meeting at my uh, Human Relations Commission uh, for my city council, and I met a lot of progressives there that are part of, like, Indivisible, one of these groups um, mm -hmm. that helps people to organize. And some people there had already heard of the Justice Democrats. And I was able nice. to interview uh, one guy, a black lawyer who lives on this one block 
of my community where everybody <laughs> on that block is registered with Indivisible and they're organizing for progressive Democrats. So I interviewed him and told him a little bit about what we did and that'll be on a future episode. <laughs> nice. I look forward to hearing that. For, for people in those other progressive groups, and there are quite a few of those, let me say just right from the bat, we're working for the same goal. I'm not sure if I consider anyone in those groups competition. And if it is, it's a friendly competition. If, if you win, um, you know, we, we'll get behind you. You know, like if we can get progressive leadership in the White House, <laughs> in, in the halls of all, all the branches of government, that's a win for us. So if, if you're a member of one of those other groups, you're not going to be hearing us speaking bad about you. Mm-hmm. Keep up the good work. We all need that. (laughs) Before we get really started, uh, let me give a little disclaimer here. At this moment, I've registered with the Justice Democrats, but I'm not currently officially working for them. This is unofficial in every capacity. We're supporting the Justice Democrats, but we're not um, an official mouthpiece of the uh, organization. We're not on the board and we're not receiving a single penny for this. Same here. I registered, but yeah, no cash, no, nothing like that. Just trying to get the word out. <laughs> exactly. I guess let's just start at the beginning here. So when you turned 18, yeah, if you don't mind uh, revealing this, uh, what party did you uh, register for? Oh, I definitely registered Republican. It was Cincinnati, Ohio, or actually Mainville, Ohio, a rural, a rural enclave of Cincinnati. So yeah, it was what people did and what my family was. So I did that. Yeah. I registered Democrat. Obviously, we uh, took a few little <laughs> turns between those days and now. Yeah. Now, you voted Bernie in the primary, right? I did. Did you register Democrat to vote for Bernie? No. Um, to- California gave us two options. You could be a registered Democrat to vote for Bernie in the primary, or you could be a no party preference and uh, vote okay. for Bernie. And I, I was able to uh, with a no party preference. I was actually abroad. So for me to do that, I had to re-register as a Democrat ugh. and go, uh, yeah, that uh, is exactly kind of what I'm getting at. I was so excited when I first signed up turning 18, mm-hmm. but I got to that point where just the act of signing up for being a Democrat was just like, ew, you know, it was gross to me. That's what <laughs> just as Democrats is going to be changing. We'll talk to you a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, but The Democrats do have an incredible program called Democrats Abroad. So if you are living overseas, you can register to vote Democrat, and they make it the most easy thing in the world. But how did we get to this point where we say, ugh, (laughs) you know, when we're signing up? Right. And I asked about the registering because one of the big problems that Bernie faced was that in places like New York, you could only vote with your party. It's a closed primary. Right. So here's what appears to be this angry old guy, (laughs) never combed his hair in his life, doesn't have a minute of TV time. What you do see of him is just the short little clips of him shouting. Right. And then you have this other candidate that is pretty much expecting to win. Mm -hmm. Everyone's expecting her to win. You know, let's face it. So many of us are looking forward to that glass ceiling being broken. Yeah. Um, All other things being equal on that merit alone, you'd think that she would have won. Mm-hmm. So if that early in the race, you're not going to be switching to vote for some candidate that you've never even heard of, this Bernie guy. Yeah. You're prevented from voting in that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of many, many examples of just kind of a systematic problem that we are facing. So another question, when Bernie lost, how did you feel? <laughs> that's That's been one of the worst days in my adult life. <laughs> ranks up there with uh, Trump winning the presidency and uh, breaking up with my former fiance. So, <laughs> um, and I'm very serious about that. Um, I, I was, I was campaigning hard. I was phone banking. I was standing outside. I was going door to door. I was making conversation in grocery stores. This is random stuff. And I hadn't hmm. been that politically active before and I was inspired to, and I really thought I, that we all had a shot. We the people had a shot of, of breaking through the out of touch establishment in the Democratic Party, and we we're going to have someone really just use us as the people, use our power, and he was going to be the conduit to just bring in that change. And when it didn't happen, I I was really uh, 
depressed. I was I was pretty out for like a week. I was glad it was the summertime from school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I should point out Miguel is a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what about you, Cliff? How did you feel? I think you covered it pretty well. It was I think for me it was more of just be honest, more of a rage. Yeah. Um, because Donald Trump was the most preventable candidate in history. <laughs> There's no reason for him to be in there if you did the most basic of steps and and yet I also feel he's pretty inevitable because we've had a system a, a series of Ignoring the working class, giving more and more power to corporations, yeah. declaring them people. Mm -hmm. Every time we strengthen the executive branch and uh, decrease workers' rights, things like gerrymandering, we as a country, we, we've been preparing to elect Donald Trump for years. And mm -hmm. yet, I don't remember if it was the same day that he went down that escalator, but... Um, I think it was. I put on Facebook, ladies and gentlemen, there's your next president. Ah, because for yeah, me, the that. writing's been on the wall. Like, it, it was right from the beginning, and you get all the uh, political pundits, like, it'll never happen. And for me, it was it was so preventable, but yet so inevitable. We've uh, allowed that to occur. Um, mm -hmm. And if, if you read Bernie's book, and I do need to point out, this is not strictly a, a pro-Bernie podcast. Um, no. But Bernie Sanders speaks to many of the the people that whose voices need to be heard. Right. And if you read his book, Our Revolution, he's got a, a step by step of exactly what needed done right. and what still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. it, it's the most common sense thing in the world. And if you look at the actual numbers of the the, the, the support of these principles, we're getting most <laughs> the Republicans, the actual People on the ground, not the people in the White House. We're in unity. We want the same things on the big issues. Yep. It's 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 the smaller points we're arguing over. So I guess I <laughs> kind of went ran with the lead a little bit there. But yeah, I I just I was so angry because Trump is going to set us back so far. I mean, he already has. Yeah. And did it need to be that way? And it was simple hubris that got us here. Well, I mean, on a positive note, though, not not that any of the things you're saying are positive, but you mentioned that, you know, we're not like endorsing Bernie necessarily as, as a podcast, but to, to bring him up as a point of comparison as part of our political story as the two co-hosts, well, I think I personally am so endorsing Bernie. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but in a way, people are, are you are a lovely audience are listening to the Justice Democrats because something in there strikes you whether you've read the platform which we'll go over or whether you just like the idea the principles behind the justice democrats are the same principles that bernie sanders was fighting for during his his race for the presidential bid and the same principles that donald trump as a president and as a candidate wasn't upholding but was posing as a populist to try to get the people who are kind of seeking a resolution to some of the problems that the principles behind the Justice Democrats seek to resolve, that we, as co-hosts, believe that Sanders had a pretty good hold on. So what are the Justice Democrats? Basically, mm -hmm. Justice Dems are a new wing of the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and we are taking it over. This is a hostile takeover. Yep. We are sick mm -hmm. of losing, and we are sick of, even when we have a uh, Democratic candidate, we're sick of them being just as corrupt that they're basically Republicans light. And so we are replacing them with candidates who will swear an oath that they are not going to receive corporate money and therefore will not be owned by those corporations. Yep. That's what Bernie did. We're not necessarily going to be hounding you for donations every podcast, but if you do go to Justice Democrats uh, website, you can see a donate button. And that's an incredibly helpful way of uh, funding us. And I, I say us in the royal sense. Miguel and I are not receiving any of that money. That money is going to primarying people that are voting for Trump's cabinet, mm -hmm. for example. Absolutely. Have you ever voted third party? Yeah, I've, I've been a Republican. Um, I've been a peace and freedom socialist and I've been a Green Party supporter. Um, and I'm with the Justice Democrats now, though. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I too have kind of just shifted over my life, pretty much between uh, Democrat, Green Party, Socialist, Alternative, 
and now Justice Democrats. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, if there's a Republican candidate, particularly one who is in favor of removing big money from politics, I've not been afraid to vote for them too. Mm -hmm. Granted, we are uh, both fairly left-leaning, but neither one of us have been afraid to cross the aisle. Right. I think it's important to be careful and calculated about how you use your vote. One of the main things a lot of people think is that the uh, Justice Democrats is a far left organization. And that is just not true. We are trying to create a left party. Right now, we have a right party in America and we have a far right party. Right. If we created a far left party, that would make me happy. I won't lie. But um, that's me. And I know that's not going to be many of you. What we're trying mm -hmm. to get is a party on the left and that will hopefully pull some of the Republicans back towards at least the center. Right. But uh, as far away from the far right as we can get them. But we don't have any major party on the uh, left right now. And that's our goal. You know, we're, yeah. we're not trying to get you to put pictures of Trotsky up on your <laughs> wall. Uh, that's not me and that's not us. But no. uh, I mean, we, just as we, Democrats yeah. is fairly, uh, would be considered for a developed nation, fairly mainstream. Oh, centrist. Yeah. Yeah. I anyone in Europe would be kind of like, this is just the most center thing you can imagine. I mean, we're, we're not mm -hmm. pitching anything radical. I, I, we'll, we'll go through the platform soon, but we're, we're not talking about anything that is radical in a global sense, although much of it is radical in American context, just because we've shifted so far to the right. That's the truth. I mentioned that there's been a lot of enthusiasm and how much that's been driving me. Let me get some current numbers. Some of these are a little bit out of date. And I mean, right there should be a sign how <laughs> how exciting this is. If we, we've been going for, what, a week and a half, maybe? We're on the ground floor here. Yeah. And the fact that the numbers are changing so fast, I have to tell you if, that they're probably already out of date here. <laughs> like, that, that's exciting. Um, so yeah, last check, we have had more than 100,000 people sign up. This is tremendous. Just think about that. Over 100 people that have not only heard of us, and you mentioned running into people that on the street that have heard of mm -hmm. us. In such a short time, there are that many people after what seems like the longest campaign in human history. Yeah. <laughs> we all just want to go to bed. Oh, absolutely. Like, we are so sick of politics and we're so done. We want to rest, but we can't. Mm -hmm. And yet more than 100,000 people, they're saying, we're not going to rest. We're going to see this through to the end here. Of those people, uh, about 17,000 of them, not 1,700, 17,000 people have donated. So they're putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. The Justice Democrats are not accepting large donations and they're not accepting donations from corporations or billionaires. We are funded entirely by people like you. Out of small donations, mostly $27, we have received more than 315000 wow. in less less than two weeks, not in an election year. Yeah, that, that's, that's really unheard of in my, in my experience. Yeah, and I mean, it's not all about the money, and I'm about to say what it is about, mm -hmm. but... That is just fantastic. That shows that there are people who are so excited about this and so ready to make a difference here. Yep. But here's the most uh, exciting part. Since we had to uh, re-record this, um, mm -hmm. you missed a wonderful little moment where uh, I told Miguel how I had actually nominated him <laughs> to run and he had not known about that in advance and had a wonderfully surprised look on his face, which unfortunately <laughs> you're never going to be able to see. But that's the exciting thing about Justice Democrats is we are sick of corporate establishment politician, this, this permanent politician class. And we want actual democracy, the democracy that our civics teachers and history teachers and social studies teachers told us about when we were kids, the you can be president too someday. Mm -hmm. And we are taking that literally. We want people that represent their communities and look like the people from their communities. Remember Romney? Everyone said he looked so presidential. Yeah, I remember that. And I mean, that's a dog whistle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it, it's saying, well, if Romney looks presidential, you don't if you don't look like him. Right. We are looking for the people that look like us. We're looking for the people that you look around on the street and your, your, your construction workers. 
your housewives, the, the people selling you food, not the people working at your banks necessarily. Mm -hmm. We're looking for people that actually represent a slice of America. And we want those people to become our leaders because I feel that they represent us better. And I feel that if somebody who looks like us, talks like us, understands our life situation, whatever that might be, they're going to have a better chance of connecting with people and actually see real change because they're not, they don't owe the banks. They don't owe Goldman Sachs any favors. The people they owe favors for, the people that donated towards their election are the same people in the community that they're from. Yeah, They're the people they know the problems of. They're the people that they uh, know the solutions that they worked out together. So these are the people we want. And these are the people justice Democrats are going to work to primary the corporate establishment Democrats. And this number is up significantly since last time we talked a week ago. Uh, the, the number of people that have been nominated on the Justice Democrats website who will all uh, swear to not take corporate bribes, 2,420 nominations. Wow. <laughs> Can you believe that? Like, And when did you just check that? That's of today. Well, good news is, is that since the last podcast, and I, when I realized you could nominate people, I nominated you, so you were counted among <laughs> those as well. So we do have that moment of shock. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to nominate myself, which you can do, and if you want to, by all means, there's no shame in that. If you feel you're qualified, please do. Yeah, I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to nominate myself, but I would, if somebody did nominate me, I would take that very seriously, and I would consider it so... Uh, Hope, I'm honored. Hope you do. You've got a lot of creativity and an arsenal of skills that is uncanny. So, <laughs> Well, and when you nominate someone, it's the easiest thing in the world. On the website, you just you fill out your contact information mm -hmm. and some information about them, why you feel that they would make a great community leader. And these people will be vetted. So yep. just because you end up in there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up in a you know, competing for a Senate chair, right. but there's a lot of positions available and that's actually going to be our next podcast. I discovered a wonderful website that will help us actually look at what positions are going to be available in 2018 and 2020 in your community. And so we can actually look through what positions are needed and I'm going to start planning y'all. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I mean, we're, we, we look at a lot of the big ones, and that's one of the biggest mistakes we make, some of the spotlight positions. But there are other things like school board, especially if Betsy DeVos gets in. Yeah. Can you imagine how important it is to have real progressives, people that understand some of the basic principles of biology, the fact that the earth is more than 6,000 years old? We're going to need people with that basic knowledge on the school board because the schools aren't going to be producing yeah. people with that knowledge anymore. So absolutely. It's so critical. And that's what, that's why we're here. We we are here to win because we can't have Democrats just getting too relaxed and overlooking opportunities here. And so we mm -hmm. are, we're going to make this happen. Another thing is of those 2,420 nominations that have happened in like, like I said, less than two weeks, that's on the justice Democrats website alone and there are other organizations that are working towards the same goal. I know that one organization that I've come across, something called Indivisible. Um, okay. Indivisible is, is not even – it's not a party at all like Justice Democrats. It's something that would uh, – it's a, it's, a it's a tool, it's a skill set and a platform for organizing that is compatible with the ends of the Justice Democrats – and it just mm -hmm. kind of lets you know, you register a group, your community, it lets you know what the local issues are. People in Indivisible just kind of help like give you updates on things and opportunities to be engaged and then you organize your community to do things. And I'll, I'll talk more about that as opportunity presents itself once we go over the platform because I have some things that have happened in the community where I've sort of seen them at work. Uh, there's another one that we're – Loosely aligned with, actually, and it's brand new Congress, and they've oh, got cool. a lot of people that are signing up there, too. Let's take a quick break for a second so we can have a preview from a partner podcast. Our experiences in this world are all about finding meaning, discovering connections, and revealing the true story. The StoryCast podcast tells dynamic tales of the many chapters of life that tell the stories of us ever searching for that common thread. So check it out at storycastpodcast.com or wherever you find your podcasts. You'll think, feel, 
and wonder a little bit more. You mentioned the word ally. Sure. I, I've been getting pissed off at people that are stepping in the way of the Justice Democrats. Okay. That are treating us as a divisive force uh, when that is the exact opposite of what we're doing. What What was the number? Was it 49% of people that never voted? Mm-hmm. There's a huge block of our population that has just given up on democracy mm-hmm. and they couldn't even be brought out to vote against Trump. That is how little they trust the Democrats. And yeah. then you get Hillary. And again, this is not going to be an anti-Hillary podcast if you're a Hillary supporter. I am so glad you found your way here and we're going to disagree from time to time, but I love you and I welcome you. Mm -hmm. But so much of the Hillary approach was just assuming that you were, if you were on the, if you'd sign up for the democratic party, you're going to vote for Hillary. Much of her campaigning was trying to get Republicans that didn't like Trump to campaign or vote for her Mm -hmm. when she was neglecting what should have been her base. And many of those people didn't show up to vote. And that's a large percentage of the reason why we have the president we have, even though, you know, there are other issues and she did easily win the popular election. So I'm not saying that's the sole issue, Mm -hmm. but we are trying to unite the liberals. We are trying to unite progressives. So when people are stepping up and saying, no, you can't do this. I want the same corporate establishment that keeps losing and keeps losing seat after seat after seat, compromises by starting at a Republican position and then moving further to the right. Get out of the way. Right. Don't be a roadblock. If, if you actually want Democrats in office, if you want progressive ideas, help us or offer a new solution. Right. Have your own solution. If, if it, We can work on two things at the same time here. If, if you don't think that making a new progressive wing of the Democrats is the appropriate route, work on something else. And if it works, I'm going to be happy. And I, if it works, I'm you're going to find me on your side because it is working and that's what's needed. But don't block, <laughs> don't block progressive ideas here. Otherwise you're not <laughs> progressive. And right. I think it was Nelson Mandela. It was either Nelson Mandela or Sam Harris. So that's weird to confuse those two. <laughs> <laughs> but um, who said that if, if you have about 80% in common, treat that person like an ally because you're going to need them. And, mm-hmm. um, and I know for a fact, Nelson Mandela had a story about how there was a person he completely like he had this big fight with mm-hmm. and she, she'd been this major ally and they had this big fight. And even when he was writing his autobiography, he still felt he was right. And she was wrong, mm-hmm. which was funny. He felt the need to even mention it, <laughs> that he was still right. But, um, but he knew just how important it was to be allies. And so he walked over to where he, she was working, gave her a big hug and made it very clear that they were reconciled. And she asked if he wanted to hang out for a bit. And he said no, because he knew if he did, they'd start fighting again. (laughs) So he left after hugging her and leaving that impression in the mind and making it clear that they were in solidarity. Mm -hmm. And then later, when he was on the run, she hid him out. And he was able, because they had stayed allies, instead of alienating her, he was able to hide And Mm -hmm. that would not have been available if he would have bickered or if he would have been insistent and stubborn. So I just want to want to say, like, we are all under a lot of stress right now, unless you're a fucking Nazi (laughs) and recognize that and recognize that other people are under a lot of stress. And that if you find yourself not putting your best foot forward or if you see someone else that's pissing you off, they might not be putting their best for, foot forward because they're tired and we've been through a lot and we are going to be through a hell of a lot more. And just if your end goal is the same thing, and right now our end goal is to not have a fascist state, but yeah. I would do one further to ensure that something like that never happens again. Mm-hmm. So if that's your end goal, let's work together as much as we possibly can and let's see real change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's something that anybody should know from best practices of their life experience. I mean, if you got kids, if you're like me, a teacher, um, you deal with family members or you deal with colleagues at work, when you find that small thing that unites you and can latch onto that to build the goodwill and, I mean, not to sound socialist, but the term solidarity, which really came out of the labor union movement, 
and is a large part of the Democratic Party's history. Just like that, that unity together to, you know, work towards common goals, despite the fact that we disagree on some nuts and bolts. I think that's crucial. And it, it resounds with the point you said before. I mean, if, if there is a, a Republican or a Libertarian or a Green or a Socialist um, who looks at us and says, wow, I really would like to get corporate influence out of politics and really just want to get that out of the way so that we can have a more fair system where the ideas can debate each other rather than <laughs> powerful interests and corporations debating each other through proxies, then this is, this is your podcast and this is the goal. In the interest of keeping each episode at a digestible length, we're going to end this episode here and continue the conversation next week where we start addressing some of the platform points one by one and we will listen to the interview that Miguel was alluding to. We will also assign homework. I'm going to let the doctor take us out with a brief word about alternate facts. You know, the very powerful and the very stupid have one thing in common. They don't alter their views to fit the facts. They alter the facts to fit the views. Which can be uncomfortable, happen to be one of the facts that needs altering.